and I'm going to begin. Um, first of all, thank you for joining us today to have a look at the topic of prep school challenges. This is part of a wider series of webinars um, called Your School as a Business. And we've already had two fantastic webinars by Rachel and Simon. And if you weren't able to attend those, then perhaps you can um, ask for the links for the recordings later. And there are a couple more um, in this series. So please try and join us for uh, mine, of course, but also the others that have gone before and afterwards. Um, my particular topic is prep school challenges and I just wanted to start by saying thank you to our supporters. Um, so we are doing this as a group of people who all have interest in um, your school as a business and are taking it all from slightly different angles. Um, it's been a really interesting series so far and I think, I hope, continues to be too. Um, but thank you to those people who are supporting us as well. You know who you are, um, but the Independent Schools Portal is one of them and um, I want to say thank to, to them particularly. Um, I, I want to just signpost the chat function and um, the Q&A section where if you have a question that you'd like to ask at the end of this webinar, then please just pop it in there and my very, very capable colleague Simon will have a look at them and um, ask them to me at the end. So we will be leaving a little bit of time at the end for any questions that you might have. And of course, there will also in due course be a link to the recording of this webinar. As I said, the title of my talk is Prep School Challenges, which is quite a niche area. And I'm hoping that um, the people who are joining us for this webinar are from prep schools or at least have an interest in prep schools. Um, and perhaps you're an all through school with a joined prep school. So welcome um, from whichever walk of life you're from. My name is Julie Keyes. I am the educational consultant and you can find me at any of those contact details there. So I have a website. Um, I enjoy using Instagram. So please feel free to look me up on there at the educational consultant. Um, on LinkedIn, I am Julie Keyes. And if you'd like to contact me via my email, it is Julie underscore at hotmail.com. I'll put these contact details up at the end as well so you can have a look at them if you haven't managed to jot them down now. Um, okay, let's start. Um, in this webinar, this is really just a taste. So it's only 30 minutes or probably 20 if we leave some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, so it's really a taste and a look into some of the key concepts that I believe from, uh, from my consultancy um, are things that are particular challenges for prep schools and things that we might want to consider. Um, you can read them down the side there, but we're going to be covering off mindset, marketplace, your customer, marketing, the school tour, know, knowing your com competition and spend planning. So let's crack on. Um, the very first thing I want to start with is something that I'm actually hugely passionate about, which is about having a business mindset. Now, this is not something that is particular to prep schools per se. But if we think about the trajectory of most leaders in schools, they've come from a teaching base and they've worked their way up their system. They've been heads of departments or senior leadership and then have become heads. And while that gives you a, a good level of expertise in managing people and leading people, what it doesn't necessarily give you insight in is into how to run a business. And why should it? Because actually, when you think back on your training, you train to be a PE teacher or a math teacher or a drama teacher. And then you find yourselves in these positions of leadership and you're running a business. And um, I know that for some people, that's quite a difficult transition to make. You're not only running a business, you're running quite a large scale business that has, in some cases, a large turnover and a large profit. And you have the responsibility of a lot of people's jobs and you have to drive that business strategy forward. And you're the leader of that organisation. And that's really hard when you haven't ever run a business before. Um, I'm speaking in broad brush strokes here and I realise that there are some of you that may have a mindset for business in any case. But the majority of heads I've found, particularly in prep schools, have not had a business background. And so, so much 
of the beginning of being ahead is to have it, having to upskill yourself in these areas of the business that you didn't have to previously consider marketing, uh, finance, governance, all of those kind of things that are so important to successful leadership in um, a small, medium or large organization. So my first tip or pointer would be to adopt a business mindset. Think about your school as uncomfortable as it may be uh, coming from an educator perspective as a business. And if you acknowledge that it is a business, then you will also acknowledge areas where you have weakness or um, a lack of experience. And if you have that lack of experience, then there are a couple of ways that you can address that. You either gain that experience pretty quickly um, and you learn as you do, or you go and seek the expertise um, in the areas that you lack and you spend time upskilling yourself. I know this sounds very obvious, but I feel like it's important to point it out, particularly for those um, who went into teaching because we're educators and not business people and that you need to spend the time investing in yourself and upskilling yourself so that you're fully equipped to lead a, a business in the right direction with clear strategy and vision. Now this this I do think is quite specific to the prep school market as opposed to the senior school market. Um, there are well over 400 prep schools as compared with maybe half that of senior schools. So let's be under no illusions that we are in a crowded marketplace. <laughs> I've just noticed it says crowd marketplace, which is not some strange technical term. It is supposed to say crowded marketplace. And um, we're in a crowded marketplace and it, there's an acknowledgement of what that is, that you are actually in a highly competitive marketplace um, compared to some of your senior school counterparts. So acknowledging that is really important. And second of all, acknowledging that you are also in a crowded marketplace that are all essentially trying to sell the same product. And that is really, really important to acknowledge because as unique or individual you think your school might be, it is pretty much the same as what is being offered from prep schools around your area as well. Well, so when you look at prospectuses side by side, you're likely to see some of the same offerings, if not all, small class sizes, attention to the individual, um, looking after the whole child, the range of extracurricular activities, the specialist teaching. All of those things actually are a given and an expectation for your customer base now. So I'd like you to think really carefully about how you differentiate yourself. And there are a few simple exercises you can do. So first of all is to have a look at what you're currently doing and look at it from an outsider's point of view. And an exercise that I've taken from my very good friends at Blue Apple Education um, taught me this, which is to have a look at your website and send it to a few people. Send it to a few parents, current parents, a few prospective parents, maybe some of your friends and some family. Um, and ask them to write down three words that they think sum up your school from what they can see from the website. And for you to do the same thing. So perhaps you have some school values that you hope come across quite strongly when people look at your website, because let's be honest, that's the first point of contact probably for them when they're encountering your school. I'm going to ask your friends and family and your colleagues and your prospective and current parents to feedback their three words as well. And the ideal is that they match up. And if they don't match up, then there's some work to do about the perception that your school has in the local marketplace or the way that they're market you are marketing yourself currently. And it's a really important exercise to see what actually the uniqueness about your school and what other people might see about it. So if you can tap into that, that's a really powerful exercise. And that's an exercise about where you currently are. Another really interesting exercise to run is to sit down during a staff meeting and ask teachers to um, write down what they see their core purposes as a teacher at your school. And alongside that, to build uh, an avatar, for want of a better word, of your ideal year eight or year six lever. What does that child look like? What are we trying to create in that child? 
And through those discussions with colleagues and in the creation of thinking about this child that we're trying to have as an end product of our um, school. Distinguish you from different schools of the same type. So perhaps you are a really strong academic school and achievement is really high on your agenda. You need to make sure that messaging is pushed through all of your marketing and stands you apart from the school down the road that says they're all all rounders. Or perhaps your pastoral care is really strong and that comes across strongly and is felt by everybody. Make sure that is part of the storytelling that you're telling about your school specifically. So there's a couple of takeaway exercises for you to be doing. Um, the, I'm, I'm so sorry, I thought that had changed. Simon, I will change that before this goes out. Um, changing customer base and their needs. So actually what you want to be thinking about is who is my customer base and what is it that I'm trying to get from them and what are their needs? Understanding your local marketplace is so key to this. So understanding the type of parents who are enrolling in prep school in the last 10 years and seeing whether you can pick out trends and changes in their buying habits. Why have they chosen your school? Why have they moved to that area? What are their motivations? How has your customer base changed over the years? Some of the research tells us that um, people are likely to travel up, to move, relocate home up to about 47 minutes from their current location. So if you're a day school and you're recruiting within a 20-30 mile radius, it's perhaps worthwhile putting some advertising just outside of that range because people are likely to move up to 50 minutes from their current location. So understanding you know, the motivations of your customer and the age ranges of those customers, what is motivating them to buy from your school is really, really important. It's also important to understand and acknowledge that um, that customer base has changed and that we have likely, unless you're in a particularly affluent area, both, both parents working um, so that they can afford to send their children to prep school. If that's the case, then there are some factors that are going to be more important to them. For example, wraparound care. Perhaps they want to look at the sporting provision. Perhaps they want to know that they can have bolt on childcare situations so that that can work around their work day, for example, a breakfast club, etc. Understanding those motivations really clearly is a really important part of understanding your customer base and their needs. Marketing and accountability uh, and metrics. I want to talk about this because it's actually something that I'm really hugely passionate about. Um, I have had the pleasure of being able to go to lots and lots of prep schools and we know how much a first impression counts and we know how much how important your admissions process is if you don't have a firm handle on the metrics for your admissions process then it's really hard to hold people to account in terms of understanding the conversion rates so a question for you to consider is do you know the conversion rate from the number of people who click on your website to booking a school tour, COVID aside, in normal times? If people are going to go onto your website, how many of them end up booking a school tour? And then what's the conversion rate from booking a school tour to actually signing up for a place? If you don't know those conversion metrics, then you need to find them out. Um, because without that information and that data, you're not going to be able to move forward um, from a place of knowledge. So that's what I mean about the accountability part and the metrics part. The modern and changing part, I think, is a really important additional thing. Try and think about the demographics of your current parents, your parents in reception and nursery, and the ones that are just going to be joining. Uh, when my children were in nursery, I was 30. So the way that I consume marketing is very different, perhaps, to the way that people did previously um, or people of an older generation. So, so much of my marketing comes through social media. I haven't bought a local paper in 10 years. 
Um, I don't travel by public transport, so I'm unlikely to see the bus stop advert that you put up. Um, I don't listen to radio, so therefore that might also be something that you might consider if it was a way that you ordinarily advertised. So think about the way in which you're advertising and marketing to people and get tell a story for them. And social media is such a wonderful way of, of telling stories. And there are schools that do this fantastically well. There are schools that get their um, social media um, marketing really on point in really innovative ways that really draw an engagement far wider reach than just their current parents. So something I would say about social media particularly is to think about the purpose of each one of your social media channels. So um, Twitter, for example, may have a particular purpose. Your um, professional profile on LinkedIn may have a particular purpose. Instagram is obviously very visual. So you're doing visual storytelling. Um, so it, you need to have a unified imagery that goes on with that. It's not it's not OK to just be taking ad hoc pictures of children outside. This is a professional marketing tool that you need to professionalise. Schools that do this fantastically are schools like Terra Nova. If you have a look at their Instagram feed, beautifully cohesive, lovely pictures, uh, a mixture of candid photographs and professional shots that really have a lovely balance there. Um, said but also fantastic um, social media presence and then there are other schools who've taken quite an innovative approach like Cottesmore and Cottesmore is fantastic because it's led by a huge personality and so his presence on social media is really quite strong. This is obviously part of the admissions process but I want you to think really carefully about the school tour and I'm not sure how much thought goes into the school tour for many schools that I've been to so when I've been taken on school tours I get a, an operational view of the school I get shown this building and um, this is where pre-prep is this is where lower school is this is where upper prep are these are our sports fields here's our swimming pool we have a production every year this is our theatre and of course part of your school tour you want to be able to show those facilities off. You want to be able to showcase your school in its best light. So absolutely part of that is getting to the know, know the school on a physical level. However, if you did some market research into why your current parents are with you, why did they choose your school over another prep school? It's more than likely that they probably did not buy in on the basis of your swimming pool. They probably did not buy in on the basis of your rugby pitch or the fact that you have an interactive whiteboard. They probably bought it bought in because of the richness of the relationships that they could see. It was the feeling when they walked through the door. It was the way that the children spoke to the teachers. It was whether the children had good manners when you were walking around. It's those kinds of things. So if you're able to be quite granular about the reason why people come to your school, it helps you to curate your school tour much better. So I put this question here, how's your brother? And the reason I put that there is because when I was working in prep schools, I knew that people came to us because we knew the children in our care so well. And you only need to sit in a staff meeting with your, with your, with your current staff to know that the level of individualized attention and knowledge about the pupils in their care is really great. So showcase that. So as you're going round, instead of showing, talking about the sort of operational stuff, crouch down next to a child and say, how's your brother? Um, I hear that he's getting on really well at X school. Um, how, is, how was your family holiday to Croatia? The pictures looked fantastic. Try and build a personal storytelling element into your school tour and be deliberate about the way in which you Curate that school tour so that it showcases not just your physical assets, but also the reason that people come to you, the reason that people talk about you in the local area. Knowing your competition. Now, this is obvious, right? So you need to know who your competition are. What, what is it that you, the 10 prep schools are doing in your area? What are they offering that you are or are not? But I've put here, they may not be who you think and the reason I put that is 
that I find um, in a lot of the prep schools I go into a slightly blinkered approach about their competition being the other prep schools in the area. And I would say, particularly in financially testing times, your competition is not the other prep school in the area. Your competition is the free, outstanding primary school down the road. And that is who you are competing against. And it's big competition, make no mistake, because that outstanding state primary is doing a fantastic job. Children are making progress. And your parent who was willing to spend 10 grand plus at your school now has 10 grand in their pocket to go on fantastic holidays, extracurricular activities and to have extra tuition if that's what they feel they want to. And also that's a less riskier option, by the way, as well, because should they fall on harder financial times as a parent, they can tail back all of those extra spends. We won't go on holiday this year. We'll not bother doing saxophone lessons this year. We'll not do football this year, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas if they've bought into you completely um, and they don't feel like that, they're, you're offering or fulfilling their expectation, then they're going to have to pull the plug on everything, everything that's their stability. And that's a huge risk for them. So think about who your competition is. Yes, within your sector, absolutely. Um, look at what people are doing further afield within prep schools, not just in your local area, and try and get some ideas. But also have a look at what your local state primary is doing and what they're offering. And don't discount the real competition that they are to your offering costs so i i don't have a huge in-depth knowledge about finance and i know that there are people within our community um, and those who've done webinars this section who know so much about costing so um, i can definitely signpost you in those directions but what i do know is that staffing is pretty much one of your biggest costs so i know that simon spoke about this in his um in his webinar that has just been um but looking at having a real look at recruitment so if staffing is your biggest cost which we have to accept that for most schools it pretty much is um and you've you've looked at ways you can lean that out Perhaps you have faculties rather than departments. Perhaps you streamlined your management management uh, structure um, and you've gone through all of the cost saving exercises you can do. The next thing that you can be doing, or actually maybe this should be the first, is looking at your recruitment process, because if you're going to spend this much money on staff, they better be good. They better be the best you can get out there. So if you're going to do that, you've got to put yourself in a position where you are an employer of choice in your area. People want to come and work for you and it's competitive and your recruitment process is professional. And I cannot stress to you enough how important that is, because the first impression as a candidate is the same as the first impression as a parent. It sets the tone. Are staff valued here? Is this a professional place to work? And what doesn't set a professional tone is receiving an application form that was done on an old word processor that is difficult to fill out and clunky. That doesn't give the right impression. Try and make your communications about staffing slick so that people feel that when they're joining your organisation, they're, they're joining somewhere who is a recruiter of choice in the area and they're not going to do better than you. And so you'll be lucky to have them because you're choosing quality staff and they'll be lucky to be with you because you're a recruiter of choice. And my final bit, I think, although I, I, I'm sure there's a surprise later on, but my final bit, I think, is um, thinking about spend planning. Now, of course, as a leader of your organisation, the leader of your business, you will have a keen eye on cost. Um, but I want you to just do this exercise quickly as well, which is to think about how much of that spend is a balance between inward looking and outward facing. And what I mean by that is have a look at the costings that you're doing in inside your organisation. Are there things that could be more effective? Are there things that you could tail back on? Are there ways in which you could use that spend more creatively? Go and have a look at the departments within your school and ask them to to make a more creative choice about the way they spend their budget. And then outward facing is, what are you known in your area for? 
what could you use your money to make a bit of a splash about? So there has to be a balance between need and also using this as a marketing exercise tool or tool. But looking at your spend in that way can really crystallize it in your thoughts. So I don't know whether we have any questions, Simon. I've sort of come to the end of my presentation. And as I said, this is a sort of whistle stop tour through um, prep school challenges. I hope you found um, at least some of it interesting or useful. And maybe some of those exercises I suggested will um, be a good basis for some staff development at the very least. Um, Simon, do we have any questions? Just ask people to, to see if they have any to to ask because at the minute um, it's a little bit a um, little bit a little bit quiet in there. Um, I'd, I'd um, ask a, a general question, which is, you know, you've been into um, prep schools recently, and um, have there been any changes that you've seen um, in the past few months since they've since they've reopened that you could share uh, with other people, perhaps? Yeah, I have been in two schools. I'm actually in one today, and something I would say is that. Um, there's a huge, obviously, there's the glaring prep school challenge, which is remote learning, hybrid learning um, and um, digital learning in general. And I split it into those things um, very deliberately. Um, senior schools pretty much had this sorted from the off because their pupils are of an age that they can access learning online very easily. They had the systems in place and the staff were trained up. Prep schools found it much harder and not just because they perhaps didn't have the systems in place or training wasn't in place, but because we have to acknowledge that learning that takes place online for a year three pupil does not look the same as uh, learning that takes place online for a year 13 pupil. So there are challenges that are specific to prep schools um, with regard to remote and hybrid learning. Um, and it's something that I would say as a trend is something that parents will be looking for now. What is your provision? What's your, how have you digitally enhanced your learning? Um, what is the provision that you're providing in case of a lockdown situation? How does your hybrid learning look? Have you trained your staff up? So I would say, yes, there have obviously been implications and knock on effects from COVID in this general situation that are more challenging for prep schools than others. And remote learning is for sure one of them. Do we have any more questions, Simon? No, that's that's useful. that's um, been very useful, though. I think that one. Yeah, but no further questions at the yeah, minute. Yeah, no problem. problem okay. Well, so I did say I was going to go back to my um, my uh, slide here. So, of course, if you do have any questions, um, some people will be watching this back um, rather than watching it live. So you may well have questions. Um, when we are not live and you'd like to ask me about them, which of course you're welcome to do, and you're welcome to contact me via any one of those mediums, um, I'm happy to talk to you in more depth about any one of those things that I've spoken about. And if I can't answer the question, I know that I'm surrounded by some fantastic colleagues on this webinar series who absolutely will be able to help you. Um, I will also would also be able to, happy to talk to you about anything to do with um, digitally enhanced learning, remote learning and hybrid learning as that came up just at the end. And um, that's another area of expertise that I have. So I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody around that. Um, so, Simon, I think we've probably come to the end. Unless you have any late entries, I'm going to sign off.